we've set out um, um, to um, collect retrospectively the data specifically for the older population of primary sinus lymphoma. And obviously, the first thing to say about this is that um, there's quite a lack of consensus about what it is actually an old patient for primary sinus lymphoma and in general, and for many other lymphomas that could apply as well. Because in every country, it's considered slightly differently. And, uh, French, French investigators, for example, considered 60 um, years and above as older. Um, we have considered 65 years um, because that's the median age of diagnosis. But uh, there are some other trials I've considered older as, um, or, or I should say the opposite, should they have considered um, people below 70 to be young and uh, fit for uh, intensive approach. So it is very important because age is probably the main um, driver for um, decision making in primary sinus lymphoma alongside the performance status into um, the, um, the um, decision of uh, treating a patient with a uh, intensive approach that would lead to a total stem cell transplant or a more um, uh, less intensive approach um, aiming more uh, to um, um, control disease in, in, in the midterm but not, uh, not uh, with le much less chance of cure I should say. So we set out to do that because um, uh, uh, it's a, we felt it was an area of unmet need um, uh, it's less, uh, there are very few uh, actually randomized trials specifically on the older population. There's only, I can, there's only one I can think of, uh, which is led by Amuro and, and his colleagues. Um, and and uh, there wasn't any much more evidence on what to do with these patients and, and, and how to deal with them. So we decided to do this. And, and we're lucky in the UK because we do have... Um, um, quite big referral centers uh, and we tend to work homogeneously so we decided to um, capture all our consecutive um, patient population which um, which gives us a, a, a good idea of, of what happens in the real life of, of the treatment in the UK. Uh, so we've collected um, 192 methotrexate treated patients um, uh, above 65 years of age and we've just, just looked at how they did and what the treatment choices of the clinicians were. We've included patients um, um, without much restrictions. Basically, we just wanted to patients with confirmed diagnosis uh, to evaluate what the treatment was and, and, and what the choices of treatment were made by their clinicians. Okay. And basically, um, but our main conclusions are... Um, um, are not um, are not surprising, um, but they were important to state um, in in this population. Um, the first one is that uh, response really matters, uh, and that means that the better response you get with the induction chemotherapy, the better. Uh, and obviously, that consolidation is also very important. Um, uh, those um, a, a few proportion of our patients. Um, uh, um, did get to autologous stem cell transplant after induction, even though they were above 65 years of age. Uh, obviously, this is a selected subgroup of patients who were quite fit from the outset, but these patients were uh, um, 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 did very well and had very good outcomes. And therefore, I think um, that, that the decision to offer autologous stem cell transplant consolidation and intensive chemotherapy in older patients should be uh, dictated only by the age. And there is a number of factors that should be evaluated, but we have successfully uh, autographed uh, in our series patients who were uh, even above 70 years of age. So it's just a matter of, of putting out there the message that people should still consider this um, 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 as long as the patient is fit enough for it, basically. We then studied the patients who didn't get to intensive treatment and didn't get to an autologous stem cell transplant. And we had a you know, wide variety of methotrexate-based treatments, which included um, 
premain based protocol, which is rituximab, methotrexate, and procarbazine. Uh, the um, the um, uh, MPV uh, protocol, which is methotrexate, uh, procarbazine, and and uh, um, and blastine. And um, 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 and just so many other people that just received methotrexate single agent because they weren't fit for anything else. And basically, our findings in that in that uh, subset of population was that um, well, they didn't do as well um, as we had expected to. And basically, if you compare this population with the one that received autograft, um, they were. Um, uh, obviously older and the performance states at baseline were significantly worse. So then it's not unexpected that these people didn't cope as well with treatments as the other ones, or the other, as they fit in, and more fit cohort. And therefore, um, 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 obviously it was quite disappointing to see that these people has a, a very poor um, progression free survival and overall survivor in our, in our follow up, which was, um, uh, um, uh, just a few months, uh, less than a year in most cases. So, um, so the message uh, with this is that um, is that this is a difficult population, and this is a real life population. This is what we encounter in our uh, daily um, in our daily practice. Um, uh, but in spite of this, and in spite of the um, Non, non satisfactory outcomes, if you, want, if you want to call it that way. Uh, we did find in this population that the dose of methotrexate was very important for the outcome, and those who had higher doses of methotrexate uh, did better. So, um, uh, the message basically um, of this analysis that people um, are, uh, who is not fit for high in, uh, dose or intensive uh, chemotherapy. Um, could benefit from methotrexate-based treatment, and the higher dose you can get, the better. And then the highest number of cycles you can get in, the better, um, because um, there's some people that will still benefit from this, although um, the, 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 the probabilities of, of, of good outcomes is, is much less. Um, so, um, we had many, many treatment interruptions early in this, uh, this cohort. Basically, I think because treatment intensity wasn't very high uh, because of obviously the baseline characteristics of the patients and therefore that translates into high um, frequency of early progressions and early uh, uh, interruptions of treatment, which then accounted for um, the, the very low um, PFS that we found. Um, and the methotrexate, uh, now that I'm talking about it, was also a very important factor for better outcomes, also in, very in, in the intensive uh, treatment populations. So the very big message of our, of our paper from both cohorts that we've not, we have analyzed is that the higher dose of methotrexate you can reach, the better. And this is not a new, um, we haven't reinvented the wheel um, because it's quite widely accepted that methotrexate is the baseline for treatment of primary CNS lymphoma. Um, but it was very um, uh, useful to, to kind of, um, um, with the statistical analysis we've, uh, we've set out uh, retrospectively to kind of demonstrate or, or at least suggest that, uh, that uh, high doses of methotrexate are, are, are linked with, with, uh, with outcomes. Um, 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 because because although it's widely accepted, not everyone is 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 in favor of using methotrexate, or some people as are not very used to uh, to this, and are kind of reluctant, are somewhat reluctant to to use uh, methotrexate up front, um, and uh, <clears throat> that's particularly the case probably more so in the United States rather than, uh, than Europe. Europe uh, is slightly more homogeneous in this, in this, um, in this approach. 